Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I do this because I believe we have so much to learn about connection and respect for people and country. Well, today I am pleased to welcome back uh, Professor Gigi Foster. Gigi is a professor from the University of New South Wales School of Economics. She works in a diverse fields, including education, social influence, time use, lab experiments, behavioral economics, and Australian policy. Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Now, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land. I am recording this podcast on the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I truly believe we have so much to learn from Indigenous, our Indigenous people about connection and respect for land and country. As we should know, and we do know if you're a regular listener of this podcast, the two are inseparable. Well, a subject that I have discussed many times on this podcast and I have written about in my own book, and that is the uh, influence of industry on policy. Uh, the in, in, and in particular, the, in, the influence of the chemical food and pharmaceutical industry on all levels of healthcare. And to that, I would now add all level uh, media as well. And the pandemic was certainly a wake up call for that. This is a story that I've been aware of and been following for at least the last 30 plus years. But for many people, the pandemic was an aha moment, a wake up call uh, to this very problem, which is very easy to miss. But once you hear it, it is very difficult to ignore. My guest today, actually returning, because we did a podcast with her uh, last year, is Professor Gigi Foster from University of New South Wales School of Economics. Gigi works in diverse fields, including education, social influence, time use, lab experiments, behavioural economics, and Australian policy. In 2019, Gigi was named Young Economist of the Year by the Economic Society of Australia. She pub publishes in both specialised and cross-disciplinary outlets, and her innovative teaching was awarded a 2017 Australian Awards for University Teaching Citations for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning. She's filled numerous roles of service to the profession and engages heavily on economic matters with the Australian community as one of Australia's leading economic communicators in the media and at live events. And as you will hear, she is passionate. She is a co-author of The Great COVID Pandemic uh, and also another book, Do Lockdowns and Border Closures Serve the Greater Good? Both are very thoughtful assessments independent of industry. And that, as I've already said, is hugely important in healthcare in general and the pandemic in particular, but society at large. With that in mind, she's co-founder of the much needed Australians for Science and Freedom, which brings together a diverse group of Australian clinicians, academics, lawyers, public intell and public intellectuals who united in a growing disquiet at federal and state government responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And there was much to be concerned about. I spoke to Gigi uh, some time ago about uh, the economics of well-being and her book, The Great po COVID Pandemic. But in this episode, we talk about the Australians for Science and Freedom. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Professor Gigi Foster. Welcome back, Gigi. Thanks so much, Ron. Thanks for having me on the show. 
Gigi, we spoke a few months ago or earlier in 2023 and we were talking about the economics of uh, of well-being. It was the first time I'd ever had an economics professor on my show, but uh, it's clearly very important. But then you've also got, there's this other group that you have helped form called the Australians for Science and Freedom. Um, I wondered if we might start, what, how did that come about? What is <laughs> <Yeah>. it about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, ASF is not the only new organization that sprung out of the ashes of the last few years, Ron, but, um, but I'm very excited about it for a number of reasons. We, so the people who have founded Australians for Science and Freedom started variously talking to each other uh, probably a couple of years ago, honestly. Um, and it's all different people. It's not just economists, don't worry. Um, although I'm not sure we have any dentists. <laughs> well, we have, you know. <laughs> I mean, unless you'd like to join. I'm just putting it out there. That was, a, that was a, you know, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm auditioning. But go on, go <laughs> oh, on. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, the more the merrier. So that is one of the of hallmarks of ASF is we really do want diversity mm -hmm. of background, diversity of perspective. Um, diversity of experience. It's, it's a huge strength and we have underutilized that strength as a society, particularly during COVID. Um, and so, yes, we started speaking with each other um, throughout the COVID period, uh, dyadically and in, in, you know, groups of three or four and then introducing each other to other people. And, you know, one of the big problems we had in the, shall we say, dissident movement or the people who didn't agree with COVID policies during that time was that we were prevented from Connecting, we, we, we didn't organize very well, partly because a lot of mechanisms of organization were blocked to us. So we, we weren't allowed to, to meet in public and in spaces. Uh, we had to be in our homes. Um, a lot of our the Internet chatter and stuff was being monitored. People were being canceled for expressing their views. And a lot of people had views that they feared expressing because they thought they would be canceled. So we didn't find people because they were just in the woodwork. Um, so it took a while to get organized. And ASF was definitely not the first organizational um, sort of product of the COVID period, but in my view, it is the, the most interdisciplinary and the most um, practical in terms of focus on real solutions. So at the conference that we just ran, as you mentioned, at UNSW, UNSW, my employer, gave us the rooms for free and gave us some money towards the catering as well. I emphasized many times to the attendees that we uh, really very much wanted this to be an event which was both horizontally and vertically integrated, by which I mean horizontally is across disciplines, across professions. So um, psychology, law, education, economics, policies, lots of different things, media people, um, eggheads and, and thinkers uh, and, and just doers across all of these professions with different perspectives to, to bring to bear and vertically integrated, meaning not just the people who were thinking high thoughts in abstract clouds, but also the people who were on the ground building community, uh, reestablishing links between people which had been uh, either neglected or actively destroyed by, by government policies and, uh, and, and bureaucracies that were really not servicing people's needs anymore. And the theme of the conference, the title was Progress Through Science and Freedom. We had a very strong focus on solutions moving forward in all of these different areas. So the, the sessions, each session was two hours long and each one had a theme, education, media, um, health. Some, some two of them were a community. So it was how to build community. And in each of these sessions, we had speakers speaking who uh, had experience in these areas, had ideas about what would work uh, as alternative systems or different approaches or a tweak to, uh, to an existing institution. Um, sometimes also how to fight the, the, the current institutions, but very much recognizing that, yes, we have a lot of problems, but not just dwelling on that, really wanting to think forward, using the knowledge that we have about how humans are and, and the kinds of potential that we have in different kinds of organizational structures, the weaknesses of, of different kinds of systems, um, trying to draw up pathways to, to improve and, and to move forward in all of these different areas. And so we had, I think, about 140 registrants um, all up. And, 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 you know, each, each of the two days, Saturday and Sunday, we would have had maybe 100, 120 people. So it was mm -hmm. actually about twice the size I was expecting, which was wonderful. And, and as you said, we had over 40 speakers from across the Australian resistance and restoration movement. 
and really, I think, planted the flag of ASF as a kind of umbrella organization in that movement that is interested in solutions and that is champion is a is champion for post enlightenment thinking. Really, science and freedom are ideas that come out of the enlightenment and they're things we've kind of forgotten the importance of in the modern age. And so we very much want to take a principled but radically tolerant approach. So we're not going to accept, you know, hate speech, but we are going to want to listen to people who disagree with each other. And because that's a source of strength, we, we can learn from each other when we when we exchange our ideas. That is how learning happens. Um, and you, you're not going to learn if you're in an echo chamber. So we tried to model that at the conference. I think we did a pretty good job. We're now waiting for all the videos to come out of all the sessions, and we do plan to share those uh, widely when they come out. Yeah, great. And they'll no doubt be available on, on, on your webpage, which we will share. But it's interesting to think that a lot of people, well, maybe not people listening to this podcast, but a lot of the general public, in fact, I dare say the majority of the general public, would say, what's the, what is there to worry about? What, what's I mean, we handled the pandemic really well. And I know you've written on this and we touched on this in more detail last time we met, but I think it might be worth, you know, reiterating over, you know, what, what the problem was. Yeah. And I think this is one of those things that once you hear it, you can't unhear it. Very true. It's, it is a through the looking glass kind of phenomenon. Um, I think many people were trained from an early age, I certainly was, to trust the institutions that were handed down to us from our, our forebears, to trust um, systems of you know, the legal system, the health system, the education system. You know, I mean, I sent my kids to public school, for example. Um, I, I had my children in a, in a hospital, a proper hospital in the United States, right? I gave birth in a hospital. Um, and, you know, I've, I've taken pharmaceutical products, you know, many times when I've been acutely ill. So in some sense, you know, we implicitly trust that the institutions that deliver these products and services to us kind of have our best interest in mind in some sense, right? That there are there are mechanisms to keep these these organizations, which are massive, by the way, right, somehow tethered to the mission of actually serving the needs of the people in that area, whatever that area is, at least in a democratic society like Australia. And sort of the notion is that we keep tabs on this through the voting mechanism, and that if we really don't like how our society is going, then we would vote out whoever is in charge, the politician, and vote in some new politician. But the reality is, of course, even when politicians change, the bureaucracy of the state generally stays the same. And the heads of the bureaucracy generally don't, you know, change that much. Sometimes you might get the new politician appointing some new person to lead that organization. But you know, many, many of the people in the public service are the same regardless of the administration. So we're not really voting for the people who lead the heads of the organizations that are supposed to service us in these very important ways. Health, education, infrastructure, defense, these things are really important, right, to, to a functioning society. And what we discovered during the COVID period, and, and when I say we, I mean kind of myself and others who were looking aghast as we saw policies implemented in Australia that had never been implemented before on grounds that we were very dubious of, we saw that there this, this lack of accountability of particularly the health bureaucracy was just in shining red, glaring neon lights. There was no way that we, the people, were asked whether or not these policies were a good idea. There was no movement through parliament. There was no, you know, legislative adjustment or, you know, a referendum on whether these lockdowns were a good idea, for example. Um, you know, people were voting in politicians who were delivering lockdowns, and that was something we'll come back to. But there was no kind of real dialogue with people who might disagree with the lockdown policy to allow a platform to have a conversation about it and decide whether this was really the right policy. Since COVID, actually, one of my co-authors, Sanjeev Sablok, has been doing a deep dive into the history of public health and has discovered, and I'm we're writing a paper about this now, that actually quarantines, which is the word that they used to use for lockdowns back in the 1800s, were rejected as a very, very costly and ineffective policy back in about 1850 by the sanitarian movement, with whom you may be aware of. Um, that was basically the movement that discovered that clean water, clean air, hygiene basically was what kept people alive for longer. And that's what gave rise to the, the great increase in living standards and life expectancy from the middle of the 18th century, uh, 19th century onward. And it wasn't actually the antibiotics and all the other things that came along, you know, 100 years later or 50 years later, it was very much those those sanitary practices that really gave the boost. Now, you know, a few things that were discovered afterwards really helped. Certainly the original antibiotics, aspirin, you know, a few things really did help. 
Um, but sanitary measures were just far more important than quarantine. So I was looking at this along with many of the other dissidents and, uh, and looking at the lack of discussion about these policies, which were completely unprecedented, and not just the lockdowns, but these, these vaccine mandates that came up um, based on a, a vaccine that was clearly under-tested uh, compared to other vaccines that we've accepted. I mean, I was completely vaccinated in childhood. I even clamored to get the HPV vaccine into my kids. You know, they were the first cohort. I mean, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I looked at what had happened there and I thought, well, that's a really novel technology that had real problems in the animal studies. And uh, previous to this was only used in humans who were near death's door. That's what mRNA technology looked like in 2021, because I did some research on it. And I just thought, why are we doing this? Why are we pushing this out to the whole population? And then, of course, being an economist, the penny dropped. They're extremely profitable. Right. And why was ivermectin suppressed? Because it's a, you know, off patent, cheap drug that's very safe and very effective. Right. So big pharmaceutical companies are not interested in that. They're interested in the pricey poison, unfortunately. So so putting together all of these sorts of signals uh, about the corrosion in our society in, in different areas, um, both in the, the public sector and in the private sector um, and in politics. I also thought about what was happening in science. I was one of the very few economists, academic economists who actually put my head above the parapet and said, this is not a good idea. And I looked around my, myself and thought, well, where is everybody else? You know, this, these policies are not maximizing total welfare, which is what our idea is in economics, or at least that's what I thought it was, right? But people were not interested in talking about it. They were just going along with the program and, and basically being complicit in, in the loss of huge amounts of, of, of human life. <laughs> and, and I just thought, well, Okay, that made me start thinking much more about the corruption in science that I had seen previously, but hadn't been so keenly um, drawn to, I suppose, as I was at that at that moment. Um, and so, all of these different features, combined with the psychology of the whole thing, you know, seeing the formation of the of the COVID crowd, it was like a cult, which is why everybody was pushing for the lockdowns. People were so afraid, they were so scared that, and they just wanted a, to to be given a sacrifice that 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 would plausibly be connected to a reduction in the fear and that sacrifice was to lock everybody down so it was basically a religious calling people were asking for uh, a religious leader and they got that in in anthony fauci and and many other bureaucrats and politicians around the world um and so that wasn't science <laughs> that was not science nothing nothing to do with science all to do with politics power um and and of course power the concentration of power is something that naturally threatens the freedom of the individual and so that was part of why we thought of science and freedom as, as two important pillars to kind of resurrect and remind people of, of how important they are, how, how important they've been throughout Western civilization and how much they are, are integral to building a healthy Western society in the modern world. And if, when we forget about them, when we forget to keep our eye on the ball, keep our eye on the people who have power uh, and, and make sure that we fight for and, 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 and stand ready to defend our freedoms, uh, we will lose them. That 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 happens mm. all the time. It happens throughout history. So you know, as much as I know, this is the unstressed podcast. I don't like to add to people's stress. No, no, uh, no. There no. is, you know, <laughs> there's there's good stress and bad stress. I think it's it's a good stress to be given the responsibility of of being the steward of your society's health. And every single person in Australia is that steward, whether they want to be or not. Uh, and so I think we've forgotten that duty a bit. So we need to remember that. I get the sense that uh, 2020, when the pandemic hit. This was a, a real aha moment for you that kind of shocked you. Uh, but actually, when one starts to look at it, one realizes that this is a story that's been going on for quite some time. I would say at least the last 30 or 40 years, particularly, mm -hmm. um, which means there's been a long time going where you perhaps haven't been as aware of this issue mm. as you are now. Mm. And would that reflect very much what the majority of the public are experiencing still? I think. Well, I mean, I don't know what the majority of, of people uh, believe. Well, right they're not now. getting they're not getting uh, shining red neon light signs questioning no. No, what was not. going on. Quite well, the opposite. Hand, that's true. But on the other hand, they're not getting the boosters either. The fifth shots. Or whatever. That is true. So, so although, there is a although I have to say, I have to say, Gigi, I was at a I was out for dinner with a friend recently. And uh, they said to me, uh, yeah, we had our booster, our fourth booster. We went overseas, got COVID, came back, had the antivirals, and we're all set to have our next booster in a few weeks' time without any hint 
of irony, without any question about it, they would be what I would describe as the perfect customer. Yeah. Um, you know, because they've not only gone for the booster, contracted COVID, had the expensive antiviral, but are backing up for another booster without asking any questions. Exactly, exactly. It's very scary how easily people can be turned into sheep. It's very, very scary. I mean, on your your point of, you know, was this a completely new thing? I mean, I had been studying corruption, um, the dynamics of power, love and loyalty, social influence for 15 years before COVID hit. And so I had I had looked at these issues, but in a in a more narrow way, I suppose I, I, I hadn't seen how comprehensive the, the corrosion has been, right? That, I think that's probably the best way to put it. I, I, the yeah, reason yeah. why I was able to spot the dynamics early on is because I already had been looking at similar kinds of things just in more narrow kind of areas. Um, and so then it was kind of, oh, well, put this piece together with this piece together with this piece. Well, this is what's happening, right? And it just was shocking the degree to which the, the society had obviously lost its bearing and, and, and also the degree to which people were just going along with it. So that crowd dynamic, that was the thing I think I may have mentioned on our last show together. That was the thing that really surprised me because I hadn't seen a crowd in action, you know, like I haven't lived through it myself. Obviously we've read about them, 1930s Germany, uh, the witch hunts, you know, even prohibition in the US, uh, the Dreyfus affair, uh, early early 1900s. So there are examples from history of, of people just becoming obsessed about something and just pushing, you know, for, for, for one solution that they have been told is the only way uh, and, you know, destruction be damned. Like they just will destroy huge amounts of wealth, health and life. Um, and so we've, we've heard about it, but I suppose there was this kind of postmodern um, conceit that we were better than that, right? We would never become Nazis. You know, that could never happen again. No, never, right? Whereas my daughter, who is a, an avid history buff, I remember very distinctly one night in COVID, she came home and she looked at me over the dinner table and she said, mom, I understand now how the Nazi rise occurred. I get mm-hmm. it because mm-hmm. I see it in my yeah. peers, right? And that's, that yeah. is really sobering and how educative, right? For a young person to see that up close. Now she will always be on alert. She'll always have that kind of, you know, smell test with anything that comes out from any position of authority. Is this actually the right thing to do? Is this actually in the interest of the people? Or is it in the interest of some elite? And is it is it science based, or is it really more uh, a call to some sort of religious sacrifice? Um, mm-hmm. Which is, you know, that this the material world is not the place for that. Mm. Well, you know, the conference that was on in November 2023 <clears throat> has over 40 uh, speakers, and I, I looked through the program, and I was away at the time, but I looked through the program, and it's fabulous. And there was one, there's a couple that I wanted to pick out and just talk about because one was very prescient in its name. It said, David versus Goliath, the power and influence of individual ethical behavior against corrupt global forces. And global, I mean, I think I, to me, I can understand the way the world works if I use two words that makes makes it all uh, make sense, and that is business model. Yeah. It's a business model. Yeah. We may have a public health system. We may have an education system. We may have a, a whatever it is. If you just preface the words business model, you understand, then you understand it. It's so true. And this is why I'm glad you're having an economist on your show for the second time, even though (laughs) I'm the only one who's been. But I I do think that, Hmm. you know, uh, the the human's innate desire to get ahead, to, to make money, to gain power is just undeniable and barely manipulable. It's just hardwired and it's not a bad thing. It is that impulse that Adam Smith wrote about being best harnessed when we have free markets and people can pursue what they're best at and they can produce something and they can sell it in the marketplace. And that's all wonderful. But, you know, Adam Smith was not as he wasn't in a time when we had the kind of concentration of power that we have today. And that kind of concentration of power leading to this Goliath, not just a Goliath in government, but Goliaths in any big organization now, these massive bureaucracies, it's more like the the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Right. It's more like what Franz Kafka wrote about, right? You know, waking up and, and like the trial, right? Waking up and realizing, oh, I'm I'm supposed to be on trial for something. I have no idea what I did. And you, you know, you spend your whole day trying to figure out what you're supposed to do. You end up in some attic somewhere, some bureaucrats yelling at you, saying you're late already for something you don't even know. I mean, 
you know, we've probably all had experiences that have an echo of that with our own large organizations. I certainly have, you know, in, in universities and, and government departments. Um, I've seen that kind of thing happen. And it's, it's this divorce between the, the process and the protocol and the standardized, you know, way of doing things versus the actual needs of the people or the whatever it is, the production process that you're trying to, to deliver. So when you have a concentration of power, that gap starts to widen um, because you have you have the creation of this kind of band of people in authority who are basically out of touch with the coalface operations of whatever the organization is. Um, that can be, you know, a government bureaucracy or it can be a, a big company or a university or anything else. And that is one of the biggest problems we have today. So when they say David versus Goliath, yeah. It's the individual versus these these massive organizations, which have basically forgotten about the individual. They've forgotten that the whole reason we had these organizations was to try to cater for the needs of individual human beings. And it's they who are the who should be the ones being served rather than the people bending over backwards to serve the organizations. Right. That's not how it should work. Just like with politics, the politicians are supposed to serve us. Right. They're supposed to serve us they should have a hard life. <laughs> you know, they shouldn't make too much money. They shouldn't have too much status. Just like I should not have too much money. I, you know, as a social scientist paid by the taxpayer, you know, I should have sort of a, a nice, a reasonable lifestyle. Like I don't want to be, you know, scrounging for breadcrumbs, but the kind of status and prestige that's available for superstar social scientists these days is, is, is dangerous. That's not good. That's, that is part of what has caused the corruption of science. But for many politicians, uh, the parliament not for not for every, but for some, the it is a stepping stone into the very lucrative corporate world. Very much, and, there, so. there, and it's a kind of a revolving door here, uh, isn't it? Really? Yep. No, sure. And if your listeners are interested, there's a really good book about this called Rigged, R I G G E D, Rigged, um, which is the update of a book called Game of Mates, which essentially just documents corruption in Australia um, and corruption in the sense of kind of grey gift exchange, you know, because it's not as obvious as just some one guy takes a bribe, right? That would be pretty easy to find. It's more that there are these whole groups which in various ways signal that they're willing to play the game and, you know, other groups then start to trade with them and they trade favors of various sorts, which aren't technically illegal, but they end up in collective defrauding the Australian people of billions of dollars. Um, and, and that's done through all sorts of different mechanisms. A lot of collusion between the state and, and private sector, favors given to particular uh, industries, um, things approved that really should never have been approved. I don't know if um, you know about this in Sydney here, but the Rizal Interchange just opened, um, massive infrastructure project, apparently riddled with problems, poorly designed, never should have been built. We are apparently, according to an inside source I have, uh, the only country that's still building large freeways to get people into the city. And why? Because the, the companies that collect tolls have a really powerful lobby. <laughs> yes. And they're the ones who ask for these infrastructure projects and the politicians roll over. Now, are those projects in the interest of the people? Hmm. What's the mechanism? What's the mechanism to say, to guarantee that that's true? Right? No, they're, they're, they, these projects are decided by a small number of people who have skin in the game, who think of it as a business model, as you said. That's the problem. Yes. So, so in, that, in that area of polity, basically, and voice, we need people to be a lot less apathetic, you know, instead of just sort of, you know, um, everything will be fine, I'll, I'll have a barbecue on the beach, which is kind of, you know, the Australian attitude a little bit. We need people to say, no, that's not okay. I have the right to have a voice in this democracy, one man, one vote, and, and one man, one, one voice to speak my mind on these various different matters. So there's a number of proposals to try to increase essentially de direct democratic elements in our society that were talked about at the conference. Um, and the David versus Goliath thing, uh, I think probably, you know, would have fit in under that umbrella. Um, there were many other situations of David versus Goliath, including in the healthcare industry and in the education sector, um, even in the media sector, right? So th that, that was a theme that kind of, um, or, or I suppose a, a metaphor that you could use in a lot of different areas today. Hmm. Well, I know I've been following this story of the role of the chemical food and pharmaceutical industry in all levels of healthcare, but to that I would now add media um, because and and it comes back to this small concentration of power. Yep, that's right. Very exactly. small. That's and then that's why we had this conference again to to alert people to the other players because it's not that you have to do business with you know, the, the one, like, you know, one supplier. I mean, we know in economics, that's bad, right? A monopoly is bad. It's bad for consumer welfare. The, 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 
supplier who is a monopolist is not kept on his toes. He, he gets lazy. He doesn't have to keep the costs really low because nobody else is supplying the goods. So everybody's going to come crawling to him. Right. So that's a that's a corrosive dynamic. So we want more competition and we want more competition in the economic sphere. We want more competition in education and in health and in the, the, the political sphere and in the sphere of ideas. We want people to be challenged you know, not in a, in a nasty way, but we want the opposite of cancel culture. You know, if you say something that's different, then, well, maybe you're the next innovator. You know, every single thing we use today, a piece of technology was at one point, the idea of some guy who had a new idea, right? A, a minority view. So if we stop people being able to express minority views, we basically stop innovation. And that means we stop growth. And that means we stop living standards going up, right? So it's just nuts that, that we are in this situation that's completely different from what the, the people in the Enlightenment were able to embody and, and manifest in their societies. We've basically regressed and, and we need to resuscitate some of those uh, those norms. Mm. You've mentioned cancelled once or twice already, and I know that's quite a hot topic in academia, is it not? Mm. That, uh, you know, if you if you offend somebody... You know, that's tantamount to being, well, you could lose your job. I mean, intent has no meaning anymore. It's impact that all that counts. Is that your perception of it? Well, I mean, I have to say I'm speaking from a very privileged position of still having my job at a mainstream university after three years of, of you know, calling foul on uh, basically all the mainstream COVID policies to which the university implicitly or otherwise signed up. <laughs> right. So. Somehow I have managed to keep having an income and, and I think it's partly my strategy. I've, I've tried to be very useful to the university. I mean, it comes naturally to me. I'm kind of a person of service anyway. So I, as it happened, I was the director of education for the School of Economics during the COVID era. So I think it would have been difficult for them to get rid of me at that moment. I also run the Australian Economics Olympiad for high school students. It's a, a nationwide competition and the Australasian Economics Olympiad, which is an international version of the same thing. Um, I run the Consortium for Inclusive Economics Education. Um, I'm a nationally awarded teacher. So, you know, these things are kind of ticks in one side of the call, you know, one column, I guess, right, the pro column. And then I can, that, that gives me enough capital that I can spend some in what the university might consider kind of unwanted territory, which is basically what I think is what the university should be doing anyway, which is talk about policies that are bad and, and just talk about policies generally and try to in, incite more discussion uh, rather than suppression of, of, you know, hot topics and things that might be offensive. Okay, well, let's work through it. You know, let's, let's figure this out and let's be tolerant. Let's learn how to speak with each other again across the aisle. I mean, that's what universities are supposed to be about. So in my view, I'm doing everything the university was, you know, was sort of founded to, to achieve, but that's not necessarily uh, an opinion that I think would be shared by all the people in the hierarchy at my university. Um, but, you know, Apart from the fact that I haven't personally been canceled in that way, certainly I was defamed on Twitter, uh, even though I'm not even on Twitter in, in 2020, uh, according to a friend of mine. Um, and you certainly see time and again, people stating some opinion and maybe not with the perfect nuance. Maybe they make a bit of a mistake. You know, we're all human. Um, but then they just have this uh, outlandish consequence of, you know, being deplatformed and unable to, to reach anybody anymore. They're basically, it's like a, it's like a digital version of pointing the bone, you know, and that's, that's horrific, right? What a horrible hmm. way to treat another human being. Hmm. Do many of your academics, fellow academics feel under siege or are aware of the tenuous line they, they walk? Is that a um, conscious thing in, in academic, academics consciousness? I, I wouldn't say that they feel un, uh, uncomfortable in the way that I might, because they don't, I mean, you know, 95% of academics are still going along with the line, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But I think they feel increasingly beleaguered by the overweeningly large bureaucracy. So mm -hmm. over the last 10 years, we've had useful services like, uh, you know, like a departmental finance officer and a departmental travel officer and a departmental, you know, reimbursements person or whatever taken away from us, um, centralized. Uh, we've had more and more um, mass standardization in the areas of, of digital technology. And um, we now have to handle so many different, we're supposed to be submitting our own marks uh, through some system that is hopeless and hangs and hangs. I mean, it's just not workable. Um, and everybody knows this. So we all complain about it, but we just sort of, you know, roll our eyes and throw up our hands and keep chugging on. And unfortunately, the administrators who are left locally end up bearing most of the burden. Um, so I always try to, you know, go out of my way to talk to them and support them because they're 
they're doing an amazing job in the context of an organization that basically doesn't like them, doesn't like that model of decentralized power or decentralized responsibility, you know, for the reasons we've been talking about, right? That hmm. takes away from the, the the grandiosity in the central at the top, right? So, so that I think people do feel in academia. And I think some also feel that there may be some slipping standards. I mean, I wrote about that 10 years ago, um, you know, even you know, after that, it's, it's probably gotten worse. Um, but, you know, that's not, none of these problems are unique to UNSW. I mean, this is, this is sector wide. Uh, and in fact, UNSW isn't nearly the worst example of these kinds of uh, phenomena. So, so yeah, I think there is a sense of being exhausted kind of, um, but, you know, and, and really in that sort of situation, can you, can you blame people for not, I guess, resisting further the encroachments of more and more bureaucracy. I mean, they're already exhausted, right? Mm. Uh, this is this is part of the playbook that that people who want power have used over many generations, right? They just wear people down, and eventually, they're just they won't fight back anymore. Have you noticed a difference in the cohort of, in the student cohort post pandemic to pre pandemic? Is is there a different kind of student experience there? Um, well, we definitely had a, a difficult time getting people back into classrooms. Hmm. And even now we have difficulty getting them to come to lectures. Uh, we are, I think the university has finally realized that it's not a good idea to uh, continue to indulge students' preferences to just stay home in their pajamas and zoom in to their fake time, to their, you know, their, their lectures and tutorials. And so we're trying to transition away from that. But it's difficult because once you establish bad habits, you know, you got to break them, right? And, and mm -hmm. we all know breaking bad habits is way harder than forming good habits. So that's been a challenge. Um, I have definitely sensed this year that there are there's a small minority of students who are extremely alert and aware of what's going on and smell that something's not right. Um, and I've, I've had them visit my office hours and, and basically after having done research on me, you know, and coming and saying, you know, please, can I work for you for free to do anything you want? Right. And I, I, can't, I can't say yes. Right. And, and when you were saying when GD, when you were saying not right, we're not just talking about within the course. We're talking within society, within society. I don't mean right. within course at all. No, yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, within. I mean, they've just they, they're, they're a citizen of, the, of Australia, of the world. And they're looking around and saying something isn't adding up. And it could be personal experiences. You know, maybe somebody's gotten very sick uh, recently and then they're putting pieces together or uh, or maybe their education is not really living up to what they thought or um, maybe they just don't trust the mainstream media anyway anymore. They've, they've caught out lies or, or whatever it is. But there's there's a sense of, of a hunger to hear an alternative story, an alternative viewpoint and and figure out how to be really useful again to their societies without just getting ideologically indoctrinated. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's great to see. Hmm. It's the the word I've I think doing a little bit of a word play is a very quick way of assessing a person's uh, where they're at on this whole subject, and I've I've done that recently at a dinner party where there was a few people, and I said, okay, I'm going to say a word, and I want you to say the first word that comes into your mind, <laughs> and I and I, and I use the word ivermectin. Great. I go ivermectin, and one person goes horsey wormer. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There it is. Next person, horsey worm. Next person, uh, Nobel Prize in Medicine for Human Health. Yep. Now, the answer to that question, that word association, tells you so much mm. about the person, doesn't it? About their perception of a problem. And, and where they're at. And again, this is a huge problem for for our movement, if I can if I can say it that way, is that there are so many people still caught in this web of nonsense that's been woven around us over the last few years, and they have personal investments in these things being true. I remember visiting my my half brother and his wife in 2022, so then July 2022 in Southern Maryland, and we had exactly that conversation about ivermectin. I mean, I I hadn't gone to the whole COVID thing. I just wanted to have a nice social visit, you know. Um, as you do, you know how this goes. As right? you do, as you um, do. Yeah, but but they one of them asked me. I forget it was my my half brother or his wife. They actually said, "Well, so you know, tell us more about this whole COVID stuff that you've been doing, Gigi. What's the deal with this?" And I sort of gave a little bit of a description. And then um, my brother's wife, bless her heart, she was like, "Yeah, you know, I can I can see sometimes that." And she's not the brightest person in the world, right? But anyway, she she's a lovely lady. She said, "I can see that you know sometimes people get it wrong, but." You know, it was really uh, amazing when when everybody got that, you know, started taking that horse dewormer, you know, and uh, and I said to her, just straight looked at her right in the eye and said, well, actually, Pam, 
That drug was developed uh, a long time ago, it won the Nobel Prize for its developer, and it's been used as a human antiparasitic for decades and is very, very safe and effective. Um, basically um, much, much more safe than the mRNA vaccines or many other new inventions that the big pharmaceutical companies have uh, thrown our way in the last 10 years. Hmm. And she sort of looked at me and just said, oh, is that right? I had no idea. Right? So she hmm. was at least willing to, I mean, she didn't fight, you know, fight tooth and nail for the narrative, but she, she just had never been exposed to an alternative view. She'd never hmm. done her own hmm. research. And again, partly because she's not a bookish person. She's just, you know, a very good hearted, warm, wonderful person, but just not you know, doesn't think that she needs to take responsibility for verifying uh, claims that come out of the mouths of people in authority, unfortunately, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. that uh, we weren't really taught that. I mean, you know, those of us in Gen X, I mean, I think we were born at about the, the best moment in history for, you know, for the functioning of markets and, and the West and just, you know, creations of all sorts of new technology and things were so great, right, for a lot of time. Now, some people will argue that things started to go downhill in maybe the 50s, 60s. Um, but in any event, you know, sometime in that period was probably the high point. And then afterwards, it's really slipped. And I think some of us just, you know, we've had we've been shocked at how much we need to retrain the whole society really to, to think differently about about what they're being presented with and and the fact that they've that people during covid were personally complicit with enforcing the narrative means that they have an ego based reason not to see a different view that is a huge huge problem for our movement um, because you know ego is you know it's, it's one of the things people protect with the most ferocity, right, of anything, mm -hmm. right? They will not, they, they don't want to feel that they've made the wrong call. Certainly not if that call led to damage to themselves, their kids, their parents, their friends, their their family members, right? That That's just too painful, too horrific to bear. I mean, imagine somebody who, you know, said to their child, you must get this vaccine. The child got the vaccine and now has myocarditis or something to accept you as the parent, you, didn't do your research. You just accepted mutely what the government was saying and, and you know, let this child get this vaccine that was against something that was hardly a danger to them at all if they were, you know, healthy. I mean, that's just so hor horrific. I mean, you have children, Ron, you know how it is. Right? I do, so I do. That's a huge problem. I have grandchildren too. And, and actually, coming back to that dinner party, one of those people was a professor of infectious diseases. But I'll let that one go. And, and back to making an informed choice for your child, I remember asking a, pedi a professor of paediatrics who's been a guest on my podcast years ago, how can you justify giving an experimental uh, medication, gene therapy, okay, you call it a vaccine, but it, how can you justify giving that to a child who has such a ridiculously low risk rate and will reinfect anyway? Exactly. And you know what he said? This is Professor of Pediatrics. How will we know it works if we don't try it? Wow. Wow, indeed. So I, mean, I, should, I wouldn't be too hard on the average, average person in the street because – at the higher levels, and I know professors, I mean, I'm having the pleasure of talking to one right now, but, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, does, it leaves you almost speechless. Look, the smarter you get, the, the more fancy and sophisticated and seemingly robust are the rationalizations that you can create for doing what you have an ego-based incentive or power incentive or money incentive to do yeah. anyway. That is basically yeah, what happens. Yes. That's what our brain is used for most of the time anyway, you know? So yeah. to, to actually be a good scientist, you have to learn. I mean, you have to have training in this. And we don't explicitly teach kids this in graduate school, but this is what you have to do. I mean, as a scientist, I can tell you, you have to put your ego on the shelf. You have to be completely non-emotionally involved. You have to allow yourself to think anything. Whenever you have the beginnings of a hypothesis, don't invest in it too much. Immediately think of what's the alternative? What would potentially go against this hypothesis? Let me find all the data that could possibly be going against this, not let me collect everything that would confirm it, right? The opposite. Because as humans, that's, you know, that's how we often use our brains. We just think up reasons why what we already think is correct, right? And, and that's, that's a very, very dangerous way to think, particularly for somebody who is in a position of authority, you know, professor of immunology or whatever, all these people who had the big titles after their names. And of course, the person on the street's going to be like, well, I guess, I, I guess they're right. I don't really know. I mean, that's another thing we need to change. Science is inherently democratic. Science is basically just the process of looking at your, the world in front of you, coming up with some rough idea of maybe what causes what and what is related to what, testing out that theory, 
seeing where you're wrong, adjusting your theory, uh, testing it out again, always tethered to data, always looking at the reality in front of your nose, right? That can be done by anybody. You don't have to have a PhD. <laughs> We've all been scientists in our little world. Babies are scientists, right? The scientist in the crib is a, the title of a book from the 90s, I think. You know, we are scientists innately. We have to make sense of our worlds. And, and the idea that somehow you're not good enough to think about things, you shouldn't do your own research because you know, you're not worthy. I mean, how elitist, how conceited, how insulting. So we need to, we need to recapture science for the people which is again, part of the ASF thing, right? We are trying to bring with this vertical integration, people who are just working at the coal face and may not have much confidence, but are doing great things, like ob objectively great things to improve quality of life in their local area, to bring them to the table and say, what do you think? What are your ideas? And let's let's exchange you know, some information between the eggheads who get to be protected in their ivory towers all the time with their cushy little paychecks and the people who are fighting to put bread on the table because maybe they lost their job because of a mandate or whatever and are really just trying to do the best they can. We, we who are being paid by their tax dollars, we should respect them enough to bring them to the table. Well, Gigi, you know, a, a professor of economics could say such a thing, but I have a serious doubt that a professor of medicine ever would. I mean, I think ignorance is a wonderful thing. You know, I practice it regularly. It's why I have this podcast. I get to ask people that know more than I do questions and they answer them. But when ignorance is combined with ego, arrogance and hubris, and worse than that, informs public health policy, oh my God, and there's plenty of them around, um, then we have a real problem, Houston, and we do have a real problem. Another paper that came up in, in the conference in November uh, was a, about an evidence-based approach um, to smart technology, but an evidence-based approach. The word evidence-based takes on almost a religious, uh, once the words are uttered that this is evidence-based, then nothing else needs to be questioned about it. This, you know, is that the perception you have? Yes, very much. I think it's one of those <laughs> words that is uh, that has been corrupted. I mean, we, this is another whole problem. In fact, Naomi Wolf had a brilliant article about this recently, um, and I and I think she's absolutely right. We've we've had we shouldn't put it this way exactly, but the way I'd say it is that we've had a a growth in the distance between the the term and the meaning of the term. So you can say evidence-based now and people just sort of assume that, you know, there's all these assumptions about what that means and you can kind of get away with a lot of nonsense. Just like you can say, oh, this is green technology and, you know, you can get away with a lot of nonsense. It has nothing to do with protecting the environment under that label, right? So choose the right label and yes. you know, inclusive, for example, right? Inclusive. What does that mean? I don't know. It sounds good, right? ESG is another one, right? Environmental social governance. Oh, well, that sounds great, right? So all sorts of funny business can be hidden under these beautiful terms now because we've divorced meaning from terms. So we need to recapture language. I actually suggested at the ASF conference that we one of the projects we might embark on is just a simple dictionary. You know, what do things mean? You know, what is a woman? By the way, I've decided what a woman is. I mean, from the okay. way that we actually use the term, a woman is a person who is perceived to be an adult female. Now, the reason I say perceived, right? So when you're walking around, right, and you're trying to make sense of your world, as we all do, and, you know, being scientists and everything, you you come up to something and you say, well, that looks like a tree. Okay, we'll call that a tree. That looks like a dog. That looks like a chair. That looks like a coffee cup. All these things. And if you if somebody walked towards you who looked like an adult female, you'd say to yourself, well, that's a woman. Mm -hmm. Even if, in fact, that person was not biologically female, right? It could be that that person just appeared to be a woman. So a woman is something that is not decided by the person who is the woman, but rather by those who perceive her. Yeah. And so it is also possible to have a biological woman versus a trans woman. These things are not, you know, a biological woman isn't a redundancy because woman itself is the product of perception. It's not the product of necessarily reality. And this is true for many, many things, right? So I was thinking of this idea of a dictionary because we need to reestablish and reclaim some words, evidence-based. Okay, evidence, what is evidence? And, and how do we actually construct evidence in, in terms of the scientific process? And, and what are the standards of rigor that we are gonna apply in different cases? And you know what's appropriate? All of these details, which seriously determine the actual thing going on are basically swept under the carpet by that one term. So I would never actually use that term anymore. Um, that was another person at our conference who used it. I would never use it because for me, it's meaningless. Like, I don't even know what that means anymore. It's like left and right on the political spectrum. I don't know what it means anymore. I don't even use those terms most of the time because uh, they've just lost all of their 
former meeting from my perspective. I, I know my wife is also in academia and she prefers to use the term evidence informed. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's and a little less, little has, has a little less religious zeal <laughs> attached to it. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, you still have this problem of what is evidence, what's going to be considered to be good enough evidence. And, and those judgments are, are really where the, you know, the details are buried and, and where the, the reality lurks. And we don't really talk about those anymore because people don't have very long attention spans and they don't really want to be bothered and they're lazy. And, you know, we've created this generation of people who just cannot stick with an argument for very long. You probably get not very many millennials listening to your podcast, I'd imagine, because they just can't sit through an hour of talking heads, right? I don't, I don't know that's true. I think the long-form podcast has found it's, you know, and mine's not all that long. It's only an hour, but some of them are two, three, or four hours long, and I think there are many millennials that listen to that. So, uh, but, but And you've also raised a whole issue there about what is a woman, and we could go down a hole. We could go down a rabbit hole with that one. I want to come back. Maybe we'll come back and talk about that another time. Um, but you also went on the uh, to a conference in the UK, mm. and jo this was one that Jordan Peterson was speaking at. And what was the general tone? What was the general premise of the conference? What, yeah. what was discussed? So this was the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship Conference, uh, or Alliance for Responsible Citizenship Forum, I suppose they call it, uh, inaugural conference the first time. And I was privileged to have been extended an invitation to attend by John Anderson, um, who put together uh, quite a number, I think, of the people who uh, were in the Australian delegation. I think there were about 150 Australians there out of 1,500 or so people from around the world. Um, you know, referred to as world leaders in various different areas, but I mean, I don't know, I think it was mainly kind of friends of people who kind of thought it was a good idea to have this conference, um, many of whom were pretty high up. So there was certainly an old guard of Australian um, political uh, leaders. So John Anderson himself, John Howard, Tony Abbott, um, uh, Mark Latham, a few other people. Uh, and then there were, were sort of um, a, a small layer of new politicians or sort of you know up and coming people who probably were being groomed to be the new guard. And then there was a, a pretty significant um, delegation from sort of church or faith based organizations from Australia. And then there were a few people like me who were kind of, you know, something else. Um, and then people from, as I say, all, all sorts of other countries. And essentially the idea and this was something that Philippa Stroud and Jordan Peterson and um, a number of other people worked on for quite a while in the lead up was to implant the idea in those who were thinking different thoughts during the COVID era that what we need to do is resuscitate some of the values of Western civilization that we have lost in the modern culture and chart a new path forward that was explicitly different from the path being charted by the WEF, the UN, the, you know, this kind of um, internationalization, the globalist sort of story where we have to all be digitized and we have to have, you know, the surveillance state and sort of making everybody be, do certain things the way that works best, supposedly, where we have this kind of uh, totalitarianism of, um, of leaders uh, in the public and private sectors coordinating together. Um, you know, so a lot of kind of trends that are negative for actual human thriving, uh, or what they call human flourishing. That's that's Jordan Peterson's mm -hmm. uh, preferred term. And so his the whole idea of the conference was let's think about new directions in all of these areas. Now I will say I like that uh, the idea that they're looking at multiple different areas. So they they gave out some books at the conference, uh, which were writings by various people associated with ARC. Uh, in relation to energy and economics and philosophy and, and that sort of stuff. Um, I would say economics was one of the thinnest, uh, so they, they need to do a little more work there. But one thing they didn't have was really the sort of practical kind of workshops. Um, there was there was a lot of grand speaking. And I mean, the, the speakers were unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable, right? Incredibly articulate, totally across their material, um, world leading, you know, in, in, their, in their fields. But it was a lot of pretty words and a lot of sort of, you know, presentations that many of us already knew the gist of because, you know, we kind of are thinking people and we're kind of awake to what's going on. And so, you know, when Michael Schellenberger put up his slides, for example, I was like, yeah, there's a slide on this, there's a slide on that, you know, kind of, we knew, well, I think a lot of us knew what roughly was going to be said. Um, and it was great as a networking event, right? I met many people there, exchanged lots of business cards. I still haven't followed up with a lot of them, but, you know, that's nice. And they had a lovely app where you could, you know, exchange views with people and all this. Um, 
but there wasn't much practical, uh, you know, material assistance. And there was no clear pathway to getting assistance from the ARC Forum organization for initiatives like ASF, for example, where I think ASF would be exactly in line with what ARC Forum people would say they want. But, you know, we're struggling to get money, right? Like, I mean, this conference that we just ran, I mean, the people who founded ASF are the main people who funded that. We had ticket sales, which were maybe 12000 but the event cost 40000 right? So where's the balance coming from, right? It's people's mm. pockets, right? It's, it's, it's the taxpayer, basically, through my salary, right? And through the salary of other people who are, you know, working in, in various areas. Um, and sometimes it's private clients because we had some health, health professionals who also contributed. So, you know, we could really use a bit of an infusion of cash. It would allow us to do so much more, so many more of the things we want to do. Um, but there was no real pathway to that shown. So the, the practical side was a bit missing, um, which is not to say that, you know, I, I think it was a useless thing at all. I think it's, it's, uh, it was, there was definitely a space for that to be done. And I'm glad that it happened. But as I was saying to one of the people there who was quite involved in it, I think for ARC Forum to not become part of the problem moving forward, it needs to get real. It needs to get real really fast. And it needs to become in future years, uh, focused on practical solutions, trial and error, the dirty work, the stuff that nobody is going to get a Nobel Prize for. It's all just roll up your sleeves and deal with, you know, the inefficient back and forth of, of ideas on some topic like how do we deliver a better health service and get serious. Like how many hospitals do you think we'd need for this area? You know, do we really want to do it in hospitals? Okay, what it should be? What about a, a traveling doctor service? Well, we have these problems with that. The doctors don't really want. Okay, what can we can we fix it in this way? You know, just just stuff that needs to be done, right? Problem solving at the local level. That is how we are going to get out of this mess without bloodshed. Because in history, right, it's revolutions that have stopped the kind of corruption that we see now. Revolutions that have cost lives. And none of us wants to see that. And we have so much knowledge, right? We have so much knowledge there for the rediscovering, right? It's like, it's like having a, a banquet laid out in front of us. All we need to do is walk up to the table and pick out the, the meal we want, right? I mean, all of the history of the West is available to us. But we need to actually go to the table and, and get that. And if we don't, it, there is the risk that the whole table gets overturned by the violence, by the anger that is breeding in people. And I think, you know, we'll keep breeding, particularly because of the vaccine side effects, um, but also just, the, you know, the economic stress that people are under, you know, the cost of living crisis. We haven't talked about that, but you know, that's a big deal. And people's disenchantment with various different education systems and, and health systems and, and other systems they see in Western societies. Uh, and that unchecks just festers and festers and festers. And then we could get a revolution. So we need to be proactively charting pathways, practical pathways um, now in order to have those things ready to put on the table to try to forestall bloodshed later. Well, I think this is exactly why, and it's probably a good note for us to finish on, that that you you know why I wanted to get you on to talk about you know Australians for Science and Freedom and uh, you know thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and have done and are continuing to do now. Uh, how do people find it? How do people get involved? Look, just go to our website, scienceandfreedom.org. Very easy um, to find. And we have blogs, we have videos, we have a place you can sign up for our newsletter. We're going to be releasing, as I said, the video from the conference, which is about 26 hours of footage very soon. Matt Wong from Discernible Studios is putting that together for us. So that'll be out before Christmas, I hope. I'm um, pretty sure. And so people can peruse that in their free time over the holidays and then uh, and write us an email. If you're interested in getting involved, just, you know, there's a way to contact us. Please just send your your interest level. What what would you like? What areas would you like to be involved in? We're going to be setting up some workshops that are specific to particular domains, particular themes in 2024 um, around the country and bring together people who are prepared to do that kind of brass tacks work roll up the sleeves, think about different solutions, and then think about how to actually get traction on piloting them, seeing whether they would work, um, starting up alternative institutions, education, health, etc., cetera, uh, media all across the country. So if you're interested and you want to do some something productive for your society, um, you know, please send us an email and we'll link you up with those groups. And, uh, and, and obviously we also appreciate monetary donations, but word of mouth is really helpful at this stage for us um, because we just want to get known more. We want the Australian resistance and restoration community to know that we are here. Uh, we're willing to help. We're kind of, you know, a free think tank is why we think about ourselves really. Uh, we're, we're independent of politics. We're independent of any religion, of any ideology other than enlightenment thinking, science and freedom, tolerance, openness, um, experimentation and improvement in the living standards and, uh, and, and the joy of people. So that's what we want. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be on. Thanks. It is interesting to uh, re reflect on that term, 
evidence-based medicine. Now, you know, when, uh, because it's abused, <laughs> it's abused and it's used in a way that once it's said, everything that follows is almost unquestionable because it is evidence-based. The problem is that 70, over 70% 70 of evidence-based medicine is actually funded by industry. And there is a conflict of interest, even though the declarations of conflict of interest often say otherwise, or, or is rather uh, neatly hidden, evidence-based medicine has been corrupted. And I'm not the only person saying that. The most cited researcher in medical history is Dr. John Ioannidis from Stanford University. Now, when a researcher publishes uh, an article and they get cited 10, 20, 100, 1,000 times, that is considered uh, really exceptional. I remember being the MC of a conference uh, about two or three years ago and uh, the people would get up and, and mention how many citations they've had. Five or 6,000 was impressive. John Ioannidis has been cited 250,000 times. So when he says something, it is obviously um, worth reading. And what he has said repeatedly is that evidence-based medicine has been hijacked. Now, one of the tools uh, to combat that conflict of interest was the Cochrane Collaboration. And the Cochrane Collaboration was formed to try and make that conflict of interest less relevant. And it has been held up as the gold standard in, um, in healthcare uh, research. But when one of the founders of the Cochrane Collaboration, Professor Peter Gurch, a professor in experimental uh, medicine, experimental science and epidemiology, he was one of the co-founders in, um, in the Cochrane Collaboration when he writes a book in 2014 called Deadly Medicines and Organised Crime, How Big Pharma Has Corrupted Healthcare. That's another wake-up call to us all. And for busy health practitioners, your own health practitioner perhaps, it is a story that is very easy to miss because it, there is an avalanche of research when a doctor says there is no evidence to support something, it implies that they have read all the evidence. Unfortunately, it's been estimated that you need around 600 hours a week just to keep up with all the evidence. So evidence-based medicine has been corrupted. There is no question about that. And that is why um, organisations like Australians for Science and Freedom are so important bringing together people from a variety of disciplines that are uh, independent of industry. And as I said, this is a story I've been following for a long time, but even I, being so aware of this, was shocked by the way industry captured the approach to the pandemic. And as I keep saying, it's a story that's easy to miss, but once you read it, very difficult to ignore. We will, of course, have links to the Australians for Science and Freedom. It is actually science and freedom, all one word, lowercase, scienceandfreedom.org. So very easy to find, but we'll have that in our show notes. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.